Hey everybody, welcome to Performance Anxiety Side Projects. This episode, I welcome drummer Mark Feldman from Mark Feldman's Level 5. He's been a professional drummer, a drum instructor, a music executive, and an entrepreneur. We talk about what it takes to turn your artistic passion into a career. We hit on concepts like practice and dedication to your art, getting help, accepting help, financial investments, sunk costs, search engine marketing, search engine optimization, and how marketing has changed over the past 25 years. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review. Check out Mark's EP, Sybil. You can pick it up on Amazon or his website. Check him out on social media. Check us out at Performance ANX on Twitter and Instagram. And I hope you enjoy this episode of Performance Anxiety Side Projects with Mark Feldman, the entrepreneurial artist. This is Mark Feldman from Mark Feldman's Level 5, and you're listening to Performance Anxiety. Thank you, man, for coming back on. You know, I, I'm really glad you brought up the idea that we're going to talk about today because I think it's it's really important and it's something that not a whole lot of people end up talking about. And you know, being an artist and an entrepreneur at the same time, it's the side of the business that artists don't like to think about. Well, I agree, but the problem there is that because of what the world is like today. I think it's a lot different in terms of like, it's sort of a double-edged sword. Like it's harder, I think, to make a living as a musician. In other words, like purely as a musician, if you only want to play music. Yeah. Um, but it's easier in some ways to make money in general. And it's actually, you know, there's a lot of things going on in the internet and social media that allow you to, if you know what you're doing or if you've studied it enough, you can help, you can build an audience for yourself, your band, um, or your business. So they're all really interrelated. Um, but I'm, you know, like, I didn't think it through when I quit my corporate job. I just was like, I can't do this anymore. Right. But I had enough business knowledge that I was able to create uh, a business and I'm, I'm working on a second one now. So, and it's, oh. it's, it wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for technology. Okay. All right, so let's let's start from the beginning here. So you were in the the corporate side of the music industry for for several years. Yeah, I I was a professional drummer first, right? And then I freaked out, and like my band got dropped. I think we might have talked about this a little bit when we first talked. Yeah, on on the episode we did a couple of months ago. Yeah, so I had a I had this band. I thought my life, everything was going to be like I thought I was going to be a rock star as soon as this band I was in got signed to AM Records. Right, right. And it certainly seemed that way. We went to John Mellencamp's studio to record, and the record company was you know a big label A and M, and they the people who were getting signed while we were there were like. Blues Traveler and Soundgarden and right. you know Sting was on the label and we're like oh this is sweet we we hit the big time right you know and then we got dropped like a cold stone or a hot potato or however it was just like over like bam like that uh -huh. boom it was over so um you know it doesn't work like that anymore it could have easily been the other way we could have been a, a huge band and we wouldn't even maybe have this conversation now. I don't know. Right. But, um, but so then I, I freaked out. I'm like, Oh, I'm not making any money. So how do I make money? I don't want to be a fucking bartender for the rest of my life. <laughs> exactly. I mean, not like there's anything wrong with being a bartender. I mean, no disrespect to anyone who works in restaurants, Right. but it's a hard road and I wasn't so comfortable with that. So I went and got an MBA and then I got a job at Sony Music, and I worked at Sony Music for like 12 years. Right. And then I decided I hated it there because <laughs> the internet ruined that business. And I'm being facetious, 
because obviously the business is still strong. It's just a different business now. But at the time I was there, it hadn't been figured out and the people were getting fired all the time. And I wasn't getting fired, which in a way was good. But on the other hand, every time a shit ton of people got fired and I didn't get fired, I just had more weight on my shoulders. Right, right. That makes so it started, sense. It started to suck. Yeah. <laughs> it, went, it went from being a dream to a nightmare almost. Right. And it was a dream. At first, it, it was a cool job for a pretty good amount of time. You know, I was at Columbia Records and Legacy, the reissue. Oh, they were yeah. like, you know, I got to meet and work with, like, you know, big artists, like legendary artists. Like, I worked with Patti Smith. Oh, I worked wow. with Patti Smythe. Oh, man. I might be the only person who worked with Patti Smith and Patti Smythe. <laughs> <laughs> I worked with be? Bob Dylan and Pink Floyd wow. and, like, you know, uh, the estate of Janis Joplin. And I worked with Santana. I used to go to Art Garfunkel's apartment to, like, work on the box set. Oh, like, wow. Like, you know, it was crazy good in a lot of ways. Yeah, that's, I mean, that does sound like a dream job. It was awesome until it wasn't, and then it was misery. Okay. So then you decided to get out of the, the corporate world and go back to drumming. Right. And you've been able to, to establish... You're uh, a living drumming, but in a variety of different ways now. So I, let's let's talk about what you've done since you left, and and how you've managed to make a living. And 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 you don't live in the cheapest of areas either. So you know you've got to make a, a decent amount of, of of income to live in New York. So you're doing something right, and I I want to know more about what you're doing right. Okay, I'd love to tell you. So. The first thing is I wanted to be a drummer. I knew in my heart that being a drummer was really sort of who I am. So I saved money. I think it's important to note that if you're going to start a business, it's a lot of the people who like preach, get rich books and stuff like that. They kind of ignore, like, that you actually need money to start, you know? Yes. Like, so I had saved money, I'm, I, and I had money from that job. It was a good-paying job, and I worked there long enough, so I had a chunk of money in the bank, right? Right. So I wasn't rich, I don't think, but I had enough for me to go, you know what, I'm just going to practice drums now for... Like I, a long time, like I, I was, I practiced drums for like three or four years and did nothing else. Wow. So that was important though, because I needed to get back to where I had been as a professional in terms of the skill level. And then I needed to go beyond that. Right. Um, right. Okay. That makes sense. So I wanted to be competitive in the business. So, so that's issue number one is if you're going to be a professional musician or you're going to be any sort of artist and you're going to make a living, you have to become really, really good at it. So you have to figure out a way for you to be able to spend the appropriate amount of time practicing your craft so that you get to a level at it where people will pay you to do it or maybe people will pay you to teach them to do it. Okay. You yeah. know? And those are kind of the two places where I uh, generate revenue is from me getting paid to play for other people or for my band or for me to teach people or have uh, businesses that teach people my skill. Okay. And, and is this something that you wanted to do even while you were... In the corporate world, is it something an idea that that grew, or was it something that kind of struck you when you were having frustrations at the end of your time? I mean, in terms of the business stuff, and yeah, in terms of of thinking about getting back to drumming as a career and a business. Yeah, the thing is, is that if I had my druthers, I wouldn't have done. If I'm going to be really honest about 
what makes me happy in terms of how I spend my time. If money were no object, I would just play drums all the time. I wouldn't deal with any of this other shit. You're right. You know? And that's true because that's what I love. I love the playing. I love the practicing. Uh, I love the performing. I love the recording. So the truth is that I do like the business part of it. You know, I've grown to like it. It excites me to be able to create a business that, uh, you know, like while I was here today, before you and I got on the phone together, sometimes when my phone gives some uh, ding or buzz or alert, I look at it and it's money coming in to me from uh-huh. the from Bang the Drum School, the business that's now generating a lot of income for me. So, so I that's a pretty exciting thing that money just comes to you and you look at your phone and go, oh, cool, I just made six hundred bucks. Yeah, that's Here's exciting. Money. So, and I'm not saying that to like be arrogant or, but you know, it's exciting to figure out a way that you can make that happen yeah. and not work for someone else. Yeah, exactly. That, I mean, if, if I could get money every time my phone dinged, I'd be thrilled too. Well, unfortunately it's not every time. <laughs> it's, it's some guy from a pharmacy calling me from India going, Mr. <laughs> so you would like to buy a uh, Viagra? Yeah. And I'm like, what? Shut up. And I have to hang up on it. So that's like four or five times out of six. That's the call I get. But the sixth time, someone's giving me money. I'll still take that. Yeah. Usually when I get a phone call, that's the same thing. I'm I'm sending money away. That happens yeah. too, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. I get more of those oh. than money coming in. But Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's... I don't know if I answered your question. I hope I did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Um. So, so the passion was always there. So that's that's one thing to think about when when deciding if this, you know, if making art in any way, music or or otherwise, is something you want to do. Is it is it something that you're willing to do even if you're not making money at it? Right, right, and because that's the requirement is no one's going to pay you unless you get that good. And if you do get that good playing yourself and being hired to, you know, give your skills for that art in different ways, if you get that good, that won't be the only way you can make money. You can think of other ways to make money with your skills if you get good enough. But you must get that good. That's, and I believe that you have to like the thing, the art, so much that getting that good is not a drag. Like getting that good has to be like, you have to really like that part of it. So I like that. That's how much I like drumming is that I going to the practice room for five hours. I love that. Right. A lot of people don't like that word. I like that word a lot. So, so you have to, I don't think you would, do it and get good enough if you didn't really love it that much. But that's step one is, can you get good enough at your art that people will pay you for teaching them and for you, you know, selling your paintings or whatever your art is, will people pay you for it because you're that good? What was, what was the hardest part about starting the drum school? I have to be honest. It wasn't, the, the hard thing about it was the actual work. I never really, I didn't struggle about that much with how to do it. Okay. Because I had been reading a lot about how online works and, and also because of some business stuff I've studied and having an MBA, I understand, I think there's one really important thing that a lot of, people, lay people who want to start businesses, particularly like different kinds of teaching um, or even anywhere, small businesses, if you look around, nobody knows really, or a lot of people don't know about branding. And branding is a key, key thing. And I think that's the main reason why Bang the Drum School, my business, 
kind of rose above all the other teacher drum teachers in New York City. Okay. Because Bang the Drum School is a brand, and everyone else was like, "Hey, I'm Frank, and I have a basement in Williamsburg. Come study drums with me." Right. Hey, my name is Joe. Hey, my name is Fred. My name is Cindy. Everyone's just like their name is their brand. Okay. And that's not how you do it. That's a bad idea. That I mean, I'm not, I, I don't mean to, I'm not trying to diss anyone, but it was easy for me in some sense because I looked at the landscape that I was entering and I was like, wow, no one knows anything about branding that I'm going to, it'll be fine. And okay. then it was because of that. So anyone who wants to do any of this stuff, just stop thinking that you're going to call it your first and last name and think of a brand. Think about what, when you go to the store, some of them are people's names. You know, there's like Amy's at the frozen food. And, but most of the time, there's some cool, iconic looking logo and a name that's really easy to remember. Right. Okay. And that's, the, that's the shit. That's what you have to do. Maybe that's where I'm going wrong. Oh, no. Did I just shit all over your business? This is Mark's podcast. That's what I'm going to start calling it from now on. Yeah, but you have name, a name for your podcast. Yes. Yes. Performance Anxiety, which I question it once in a while now. No, I think it's great. It's funny. It shows you have a sense of humor. It's easy to remember. And it tells you a lot about who are your guests on the show. I think it's a great name. Oh, good. I, I question the, some of the decisions I make some, on some of this stuff. So I'm glad to hear people like it. I've heard it from some, you know, I don't ask. And maybe that's part of the, the problem. I, it's hard for me to, sometimes to ask for help. And I think maybe that's a, a, an issue with a lot of people who do things that are non-traditional for income. Uh, they're afraid to ask for help. I know I was. Even in college, learning photography, I was afraid to ask for help. I think you that's a, 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 that's a really important point that you just touched on, um, that you need to get help with the things that you don't understand as well. Like I, one way I took, think about the ways I got help. First of all, I took shit tons of drum lessons, and I still study. Like, I take lessons with uh, a drummer named Dave DeCenzo, who I think is one of the best drummers in the world. Oh, I know. I, I know him, yes. Yeah, he's, seriously, he's mind-blowingly good. Wow. So I go to Boston to study. I live in New York City. I go to Boston to study with him. Wow. Because that's how good he is. Um, like, you know, if you were a drummer and you wanted to study with, like, Dave Weckl or Vinny Kaliuta, that's like, those are the names that people think of a lot. Yes. Those guys aren't so available, but Dave DeCenzo is just as good as those guys, and he's got a thought-out method of teaching. So, okay. to me, studying with him is like studying with Vinny Kaliuta or someone. It's that level. Okay. So, so another important point is to keep learning. Don't be afraid to ask for help and, and continue to learn even – except the fact that, that you don't know everything. Always. With, and with all aspects of the things you're working on, most of the best businessmen are constantly learning too. So it's not just about me continuing to become a better drummer by getting help with that from people, but it's also about learning about business and uh, – if you have to pay people to help you with your business, like, cause you can't be an expert in everything. So being a good manager and a business person means understanding what skills you have. And if you have a weakness, you don't necessarily have to become the expert, but go to the person who is the expert and get them to help you. So I'll give you a, a good example. I'm, I'm working on a new business, which is an online drum education business. Oh, cool. So, because my school in New York is a physical school, but it's kind of maxed out. Like, in the physical space that I have in New York City right now, I'm teaching, like, at least 50 hours of lessons per week. Wow. 
And now I don't teach them. I have teachers who work for me who, who do that. Okay. And I have I hired great, great teachers. But the point is that unless I want to open multiple physical locations, right now I'm sort of at the level where this business is going to be in the brick and mortar world. Okay. So I don't want to open 10 of these, at least right now I don't want to. It seems like a, a real hard way to grow, but online, if you are have a model that's one to many in your communication and teaching, then that can scale in a much bigger, faster, efficient way. And so that's what I'm working on. Okay. So the, the example of of me getting help is if you hurt if you're like. If you know anything about the music education market online, you might think I'm a, a fucking idiot because it's very crowded. Right. right. Yeah, I'm sure. So, but the thing is, I recognize that, but I still thought I had something to offer. So, but what I needed it was how to differentiate myself to enter the market in a way that would give me a good chance of success. See, this, so, this is exactly what I what I need to know about for specifically things like this podcast, how to differentiate myself, separate myself from the literally million other podcasts out there. Right. Interesting. So, so I don't know that much about the um, world that you're living in with that. Right. But I'm sure you know a lot about it. But um, but my answer to the issue, which I'm fa I'm facing the same issue that you're facing. So what I did was I went to um, these consultants who I think they're the best consultants, like the top notch, top level consultants on branding and positioning of a brand within a market. Okay, that exists. Like the guy who I went to wrote the book called Positioning in the 70s with his partner. And, and that's the book that when any, anyone talks about positioning of a brand and how to differentiate it from others so you can succeed, that's the book that they talk about. So I just said, well, I'm going to go to that guy. That makes how sense. Be better than that. That makes sense. And he gave me a, a strategy that I feel very confident in. There's no way I would have come up with this by myself. No way. Wow. So he gave me the answer. Now, it costs, it costs serious money. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's not cheap to do that. But I think it's going to pay back because if this my business goes the way I hope it goes, it, it could very well make me wealthy I, be I believe so so anyway so that's a good example you hit the nail on the head when you said seek help it's really important to seek help either in anything that you're developing either in business or as an artist that's yeah and then and and that's it's not easy to do all the time so it, it's no. whether it's fear or pride it's something for me it, it's a little bit of both. And it, it, I've always been real hard on myself. Like even when I'm trying to learn something new, I've always been the person that thinks I should already know it. Right. And I've got to get over that. You can learn a lot on your own by reading and studying and stuff like that for sure. But sometimes you just got to go, man, that's not my thing. I got to hire someone to do that. Yeah. And especially these days with everything changing, you know, traditional methods don't, always work with with newer markets totally yeah i think that's key is to recognize if you don't understand something get help you know i guess the hardest part is to recognize what the issues are like what are the things that you need to have together and 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 working properly and knowing well X, Y, and Z, I know X, I don't know Y and Z. But, so you have to be able to determine what are the factors. And I, th I think you you made an interesting point when you were talking about hiring somebody to help you with the online part because you're investing in it now. So now, you know, now there's a serious, 
th- there's something serious there. You know, it, it was your art. And let's say, for example, you hadn't even started your jump school. Now you've got a, a financial investment in it because you, you had somebody help you determine this. So now you've got to get good, you know, make sure you keep up, keep your skills at a high level. But now there's even more than, than, than the love of the art. Now there's a financial interest at stake because you've invested time and, and money in having somebody help you out. Yeah. There's an investment there. And in a way, yeah, you're, it, I guess it makes it serious. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that, that, that's kind of my long-winded way of saying that. <laughs> yeah, so once you invest money in it, that being said, you know, there is a a, a concept called sunk cost, okay. which means that even if something is serious, like say I invested, you know, I don't know, say I invested $50,000 in my business or something. Okay. And... I found out after by testing or by releasing it that um, I screwed up and the idea sucked or my execution was wrong. And so then there's the idea that, oh, some people would be like, well, I spent this much money. I'm going to keep putting money in until it works. That's sometimes fallacious thinking because putting good money in after bad, that money that I invested originally that got me to a bad position in my business, that money's gone. Yeah. So you actually shouldn't use the, the number that you invested as a reason to continue. If okay. you lost that money because you made a bad decision or you're, you were wrong about the business, that doesn't mean you should keep investing. You, you have to let go of that. Okay. That's a good point. That's a very good point. The business world has changed a lot, and you know you you've seen it on both ends. You, you know you've as the artist and as the executive, but you've also seen it in the way it used to be in the way it is now. What's the biggest difference in, in the way artists have gone about things in the past to the way they can they have now? What, what I guess what I'm saying is, what are the opportunities with digital? marketing and, and, and a, what what is a good way of marketing that, that maybe wasn't there or wasn't available to people 20 years ago? Well, I mean, I think you know the answer. The, the answer is that the existence of this, uh, of the internet and, and social media and how much we can do with it now that you can easily, you know, share video and music. And um, it's so advanced that, A, if you're a musician, we use this as an example, distribution is free. So there's no gatekeepers anymore, at least to get your stuff available to the world. Um, But that's a double-edged sword, clearly, because now the output of music into the world is so much greater than it used to be. Yes. And there's no filtering system that exists, really, that is... No one's figured out, like... The filtering used to occur because of the gatekeepers and getting people on radio and stuff like that. Yes. But now there's no filter... So it's really hard to get noticed. And so that's the downside of it. But I still think it's a better situation because because you don't have to, you can definitely get your stuff out there and then you just have to learn how to use the tools that digital marketing and, and the internet and social media makes available to you in order to... Um, either make money in a business or get fans for your band or for you as an artist or, you know, understand how the search engines work because honestly the search engines are kind of how my brick and mortar business, that's kind of the biggest reason that it's successful is because people find me on Google. Right. So, So you have to figure those things out. And they're all totally uh, 
doable. The, the information is out there to figure it out. It's not really a mystery, but people make it seem like it's a mystery. But you just got to um, learn what the steps are to make your websites easily searchable on Google so that whatever your business is, what uh, would people search for to find your business, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. And then you have to make sure that if somebody, say if your business is a regional business, then you have to make sure that if someone searches for the proper terms in that region that you come up very high on the list. And then you have to make sure that your website doesn't suck. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have to make sure that you're good at communicating so that people will buy from you. And then you have to make sure that the product is good so that people will come back and talk about how good you are. So you're talking about adding like search engine marketing, search engine optimization to your skills, to like your drumming skills. And, and, and all. is that something that, it's worth investing in having somebody help you out with, or is that something that, that artists can do on their own just as easily? I think both. I think in the beginning, I just read some books on it. And then I started doing what the book said. Okay. And it worked actually. Oh, so that's good. So it, yeah. It actually worked. <laughs> Holy shit. I read something. It worked. So my friends make fun of me, like, like my nickname in high school was Pointy Head. <laughs> that's that's an awkward nickname. That's well, it was one of my nicknames. Okay. Some, some of them can't be repeated <laughs> on air. But my because I was like I studied hard and stuff like that. That's I had a couple of friends who used to call me Pointy Head. <laughs> and, but I like think that's cool now. But you know how like the nerves actually take over now. And oh yeah. Over over it. Yep. So, so that my pointy headedness got me so that when you search for drum lessons NYC on Google, I usually come up number one. Bang the drum school. Okay. And then that's why money comes into my phone when I'm not looking because of that. So. Those things are important, but guess what? That could have never happened 20 years ago. Exactly. So that's magic, in my opinion, the fact that this stuff exists and y you can, you know, it used to, you have to do everything by mail before. You'd have to put ads in some newspaper and yeah. like, you know, there was other physical ways that these things happen, but, but you know, there was a way to make money by doing this kind of stuff, but not like the way it happens now. No way. I, I've got a, a question for you. Let's let's say there's, let's just take one generic band, okay? Things have changed in the industry. Now, 20, 30 years ago, they'd, to make money as, as, as musicians, they would have to get signed and get a record deal. And that's hard work. That, that's not easy to do. Otherwise... It it would be it would be like it is now where everybody's making music, so now that's gone, and the, like you said, the gatekeepers are gone. There is such an influx of music into into the world, done by so many different people. Some great, some not so great. Is it harder for a decent artist to get a record contract back then, or to get noticed with so much out there now? Wow, that's a pretty interesting question. It might be similar. Uh, okay. I'll, that would make sense. Yeah, I think it might be similar, like sort of like uh, different scenarios resulting in a similar difficulty in getting noticed. Yeah. But in both instances, I think, the quality of the product still has to be really good. And I think that the reason why, one of the reasons why so much of the stuff that's out there now, there's a glut of material. Honestly, like 95% of it is shit. Yes. And I know that sounds like horrible, like mean, and, but I, I, I believe that's the reality of it, you know? Yeah. Like when you, 
have a friend ask you to go see a band, like some buddy of yours, don't you kind of go like, oh, man, I don't know if I want to go see you. Because you don't know if they're any good, and you assume that they suck. <laughs> it depends on my friend and which friend's asking me, but yeah. Right. Unless, except your friends who are maybe professional musicians or yeah. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, that's the example of, you know, so you have to be at a level, a record company ready level, and then, even then, it doesn't matter because then you still have to figure out how to get noticed and, and all the old ways of doing it don't work anymore. So it, there's, it's basically the same problem. It's just different hurdles now. It's different hurdles, but I think the difference is that it's better now because you have control. Okay. So before you had no control, you could just, the best thing you could do was either meet the right people who create a network that would get you towards the record company people so that you could get in front of the proper people in the record company and then possibly get a record deal. But then you still, your control was almost non-existent. Like you could get dropped, you know, you might, the guy who signed you at the record company might get another job and then everything would fall apart. Right. You've got no champion at the label. So now, even though everything's still difficult, you can make your own music, you can make it good enough, you can get it distributed, you can control your own marketing. And if you're smart enough about all of those things, you can develop a fan base and you can ultimately make money. So even though it's still maybe just as difficult it, it may be a better atmosphere for the musicians or artists, basically. It totally is because you, you don't have to rely on anyone. It's not easy because you're uh, – that. this is where I think musicians maybe get frustrated because they're like, oh, man, I don't want to learn all that shit. Yeah. Oh, I got to learn how uh, <laughs> internet works and, like, I don't want to do marketing and branding and – well, okay, don't do it, but then nothing's going to happen. So you've got to suck it up and realize that the new situation we're in requires that you get good at the business. Otherwise, you're doomed. That's a good point. That, that, I think that may be the most important point of this episode is that you've got to expand your skills to something beyond your art to to marketing it because no one else is going to do it for you anymore yeah the, if you if you hang on to that dream of like oh man i'm gonna like i'm gonna just keep playing gigs and then at one gig some dude's gonna be there who's gonna like go yeah i'm gonna sign you and make you famous and if you use that as your model you're you're screwed then you should just i don't know man go to law school or McDonald's. get jobs at McDonald's or because like I know I'm being a jerk about it but I'm just trying to be realistic you can't think that way anymore or nothing will happen yeah well you know the world's changed the markets have changed everything is different than it used to be and you you can't approach it the way it was done even 10 15 years ago no way so what was the uh, the one? If there's, there's one thing you could change about being an entrepreneur in this in this age, you know, from starting your drum school to, to drumming. Is there any failure that you would like to to have a second shot at, or or, or, or something that you've learned that you would do differently? Well, that's an interesting question. That's I try to make I, those. <laughs> I, I feel like if I could go back in time and if I had that kind of like uh, view of the future, the only thing I would have done differently is 
I might have I might have skipped the brick and mortar and gone directly to the online world. Okay. Now I'm hesitating even in saying that because that makes it sound like I don't like that business, but I really do like it. Um, but and there's that human contact and that one to one, which yes. is important. Yeah, exactly. But it, but you know, a physical, a brick and mortar building, especially in an area like New York, can be limiting. Well, only because if you're going to think about strictly as an entrepreneur and strictly from a wealth generating perspective, then if in 2009 I started this business, if in 2009 instead of like opening a brick and mortar, I had gone directly and become uh, an online drum educator, I might be, uh, you know, wildly wealthy by now. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's, but I still like, I, you know how things have a way of, of going their own at their own pace and the story gets told and I wouldn't be able to do this online business now if I hadn't taught and seen and overseen the teaching for 10 years like I did. You that's know what I mean? Point. Yeah, that, that's a good point. That got me ready for what, where I am now. So it's hard to say, you know, that like if I had a time machine, then I would just go uh, into the future and I'd see what the winning lottery numbers were. <laughs> and that, that's what I wish most of all. Yeah, no kidding. Man, well, look, I've, I've learned a ton and it's kind of made me rethink some of the things that I'm doing and, and, realize that I've got some studying to do while I, while I continue to do this show. So I really do appreciate you spending some time with me and, and, and helping me get more focused on, on some of the things that, that I can do to expand this idea that I've got. So thank you so much for your time, man. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I love talking with you. No one else will listen to all of my nonsense. So <laughs> I appreciate you, uh, you know, having me on the show as I did last time. I, I thank you. Oh, uh, well, it's my pleasure. And, 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 you know, total disclosure for everybody listening that this was your idea. I just, I asked you to come back on and see if there's anything else you want to talk about. And, and you came up with this idea. And as soon as I saw your email, I said, let's, let's schedule it immediately. Let's do this. Cause this is a great idea and it's something that can help me out. And I'm hoping it can help out other artists that that listen to the podcast so for all of us thank you sure thank you i i really appreciate it buddy